Hey everybody, Brian Von VA here, back at it again with another set of D&D stories, and today we're going to be talking about what's your biggest mind f that you've seen during a campaign part four. I'm DMing a world where one of the factions is effectively a cloister of nuns that focuses on helping orphans and others displaced by war. In reality, they're the Slavers Guild, but they smile and nod and act pious. The players just went on their first rescue mission near a war-torn border with the sisters, rescuing some kids, hunting them down, dragging them back to the sisters. Then the entire time the kids are all screaming in terror. <laughs> One of the female players made a point of saying, I tune out the screams of the kids. I was told to grab them. I grabbed them. <laughs> The kids will now be dragged hundreds of miles from home and sold into slavery while the players escort the sisters and make sure the kids stay captive. Yeah, I hope no one in the party finds this. The fact that they just kind of brushed over it, I think they already know, and they're just playing an evil campaign at this point. <laughs> this one happened a few years ago around the time Critical Role was starting their second campaign. At the time, I was playing my life domain cleric, Torxina in the first campaign I played her in. Torxina is a protector ASMR, and originally her backstory was just, she's a good person who loves to help the poor and the needy and such. As the campaign went on, I saw the episode of Critical Role during which Yasha popped her necrotic shroud for the first time. I thought that was really cool, and talked to my DM about having some kind of dark secret in Torxina's past come up and maybe change her to being evil or something like that. DM went, yeah, I got you. Don't worry about it. And I let him do what he wanted to do. A few days later, he pulls me into a solo session on Discord. And Torxina gets kidnapped by someone. Later in the session, this person reveals that they're Torxina's twin sister, Livy. Only Livy is a fallen ASMR war domain cleric. Livy grew up with a very different life than Torxina, having been on the flip side of the coin. Where Torxina had only good things in her life, Livy had been dealt a much rougher hand. Over time, Livy took to a much darker approach to life, and the hate within her built up to the point where she decided to kill all of Torxina's friends and show her how it felt to have everything taken from her. So, for a session, I played as Livy, taking Torxina's place in the party. I acted a little different. I explained that Torxina decided to change up her hairstyle a bit. I was a bit more outgoing than usual, and nobody picked up on the fact that I was playing another freaking person. I told the DM I was going to pull each party member aside and kidnap them by knocking them out. I managed to take down the paladin, but the sorcerer rogue managed to hit her with a poison that knocked her out, so that ended things rather quickly. Which was fine, I didn't actually want to kill the other party members, but it was fun to play a straight up insane murderer for a session. They actually did manage to get Livy some help, and later in the campaign, she made another appearance as a leader of a small group of refugees trying to find a place to live. Okay, I have to share. Started a D&D campaign in a homebrew setting. The five-player party will all be playing childhood friends. They went their separate ways and happened to be back in town and are going to meet up. I explained that the campaign will be how their lives began to weave back together, leading them on dramatic quests across the world. Unfortunately, the cleric player had to drop out before we ever started. I tell them to keep that between the two of us and not to tell the others. When the other four players show up for the first session, I explain that the cleric's player won't be there that week, and that I'll be playing their character as a background NPC until they're able to join. The first scenario is the party meeting up at a coffee shop the ranger's aunt owns. To find that, the rogue's patron, the town's librarian, has been found dead in the library. Dun, dun, dun. The barbarian, Roger, ranger, and wizard all investigate the mystery while having the occasional scene with the cleric. I place the cleric as a clerk in the mayor's office, and all the clues lead to the mayor being involved in worship of some dark god. The bard-like ranger has been establishing that he's been in an on-again, off-again relationship with the cleric, and approaches her <clears throat> pillow talk, <laughs> pillow talk, to gain access to the mayor's office and confront the big bad evil guy. 
When they challenge the mayor, he tells them that they did confront the dead librarian in regard to the evil dark god, but protests that he was looking to commission adventurers to destroy a lost temple beneath the town. Eventually, this is confirmed, and the party goes down through the sewers to find the Temple of Darkness. There, they find that the cleric PC is leading shadow daemons in worship to a lost god of the deep night. The ensuing battle leads to a moment where the ranger has to deliver the killing blow or allow his longtime love to escape. He deliberates, but she gives him the slip. I explained that cleric player is not going to be joining us at all and that the plot was adapted to pull off this twist. The whole way through, the players had treated the cleric as part of the party, just not an active participant with the idea that she would be more involved in the next scenario. So this was a while ago. I rolled a character, nice old man with a long white beard and lilac colored robes with stars and moons all over his pointed cap. He was Altar the Wise. He smoked a pipe and had a habit of blowing smoke rings. He was a man of few words, trusting his high perception, <laughs> wink wink, and calm manner to help the party out of most jams. Until combat starts, of course. Then his hands start waving around in an obulus of mysterious gestures, and arrows seem to halt before they hit him. He moves with unnatural haste, and when somebody closes the distance, his stave whirls around and smacks them four times a turn. Alatar is a monk. Way back when I started playing, the DM managed to invent the most subtle and devious obstacle. I've still never met its match. Nearly 20 years on, we would walk down a corridor, the walls curved around. But other than that, we're pretty normal, as was the floor. It also appeared to be a really long corridor, because even after walking along it for a half an hour, nothing had changed. Wasn't until I started running a chalk line along our path that we finally realized there was a trap that would teleport us unknowingly to a spot that was back down the way we came. The curve of the path and monotony of the features made it near impossible to tell unless you were paying attention. So that 30 minute walk was basically us treading the same 150 over and over again. It did teach me a lesson though. Always stay alert and don't take things as they seem. I DM the campaign where the adventurers recovered an artifact for an undead sorcerer. He was dedicated to freeing the undead and restoring their free will. Well, of course, after the artifact, a Harper agent informs them that he is an evil sorcerer who appears as an undead activist publicly. A lot of comedy in the beginning. Jump to a year and a half later of weekly sessions. They are still tracking him down and dealing with armies of undead. They own a mercenary band and together with the city of Nesme and Waterdeep storm his island. They finally reach the big bad evil guy and fight him to the death. After the boss fight, he uses time magic to freeze them and bestows upon them undead powers to fight the true evil. The drow are planning the resurrection of an old god and only the undead are immune to the god's immense powers. In storms, the Harper agent who transforms into a drow matriarch, followed by a small army of striders. Ugh, I hate striders so much. Sorcerer quickly uses time magic to help the party escape, sacrificing himself and sending the party 20 years into the future, where they are pulled out of a cobalt mine near 10 towns by strangely dressed dwarves with odd machinery. And so begins part two. The good guy turned big bad evil guy is actually a good guy. <gasps> a double secret double agent. The Harper agent is actually a drow matriarch and now they're in the future at the beginning of the industrial revolution following modified Eberron rules. The world is in chaos ruled by factions of mages, religious communist zealots, and a growing elite industrial class. And the preparations for the return of the old god is nearly complete. Had a bit of a meta mind fuck a while back, okay. Guy I worked with was infamous for using the double wrench tactic. 
and either busting his knuckles or breaking what he was trying to loosen, sometimes breaking the wrenches. So, we are in a party together for a while and I told him we had to figure out a way to incorporate it into one of our fights. He was an orc barbarian with a massive maul that had a large iron hoop on the end of it. That's a weird looking weapon. We enter combat with a group of what could be described as an unidentified abomination. Ugh. Nobody could identify it with skill checks, but it was basically a shadow panther with a deadly tail and huge ass claws. So I throw a javelin at one and bam, crit the fucker. The orc was already engaged with it. So he tells the DM, I put the hoop of my hammer into the javelin shaft in its neck and use the leverage to tear its head off. Rawr. The DM takes a deep breath. <sighs> Roll a strength check. 10 seconds later, he's covered in ichor and holding the head in the air on a skewer like a kid with a lollipop. Could I use a bonus action to take a bite out of the head while I stare at the others? <laughs> I, I love it. Roll intimidation. And a con save for the blood slash ichor. The orc crits intimidation and passes the con save. You fling the skewered head around, almost dancing a haka as you do. Then you turn to the rest of them, take a bite out of the head, and spit the eye of the creature, some of its teeth, and an ear at the other two creatures. What do you scream at them? I'm not trapped in here with you. You're trapped in here with me, motherfuckers! <laughs> the rest of you see this, and not only are you in absolute awe of what just happened, you've all gained inspiration. <laughs> and your next attacks are at advantage due to the creatures now being absolutely terrified by this amazing curry they've witnessed. My fighter yells, Fight till their blood rains down from the heavens! The bard pulls out a lute and starts playing Raining Blood, and the girl playing the bard pulls out her phone and plays it on YouTube. The rest of the encounter was played to the brutal sound of Slayer, and the bard stayed out of combat range just so she could shred Slayer instead of fight. The last mind give it all, the Barbarian and I rolled close to perfect the whole session. My lowest roll was a 15 the whole night, and that 15 was still enough to land a killing blow on the enemy at the beginning of the ruins we were in. Me, him, the Ranger, and the Warlock handled the other two and every enemy leading up to the big bad, just to keep the momentum going with the music, and the Bard landed the killing blow on the big bad evil guy. Best night ever. Hey everybody, Brian Von Vier here back at it again checking in after the vid. Please make sure to leave a like, subscribe, ring that bell, and of course, in the comments below, let us know what the biggest mind fuck you've ever seen during a campaign was. All the love, be safe, and we will see you next time. Bye for now.